Well, hey everyone, Andy Sterwich here with Altero Software, coming to you from sunny Orlando, Florida at Microsoft Ignite. And I've got two good friends of mine here. I've got uh, fellow Microsoft MVPs, Thomas Maurer and Mike Nelza. How's it, how's it going, guys? Good. 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 Well, hey, uh, we saw the keynote this morning. Mm -hmm. And, or I should say, keynotes. Yes. Yeah. Right? Because we had the Vision keynote from Sacha. And then we also had the breakout keynotes, right? right. So um, I know I saw the one by Scott Guthrie. I know there were a couple other ones. There was yep. like an Office 365 focused yep. one. There was another one that was more focused on like development and right. Power BI and you know, that yep. type of stuff. So um, I know Thomas, you saw the Scott Guthrie one as well. Yep. Um, is that the one you watched as well, Mike? No, I actually uh, saw the SQL one, the, the, the data one. Um, when oh, they okay. talked about, yep, they talked about Power BI and SQL and stuff like that. Gotcha, okay. Well, I mean, regardless of which one you know anyone saw they were all great right yeah, yeah. I mean, really there's a lot of great information and I thought what was really interesting about the um, the vision keynote was in past years I feel like the overall vision kind of got a little bit diluted from the technical announcements before Satya or after Satya? well I mean even a little bit after Satya but this year I really feel like the vision keynote was truly a vision keynote you know what okay. I mean Really defined yeah. that message. Talked about how you know we're empowering everyone on the planet to do more. Mm -hmm. um, and really, I thought it was interesting how they showcased so many use cases and um, mm -hmm. what I would call almost philanthropic type of use cases. Like the one, the thing that they announced at the end, um, you know, AI for humanitarian causes. I thought that was really yeah. neat. Um, so I mean. You know, with, with all that in mind, you know, what was your guys' gut reaction to the keynotes? Thomas, I guess I'll pick on you first. Yeah, so I think first of all, it was like AI, AI, AI. <laughs> right. I right. mean, that's like really the mess a big message out there, um, which I really liked. Like, you get the message where things are going, right? Uh, in terms of like a little bit more technology about Azure, I think in the Scott, uh, Scott Coffrey's keynote, where he like a little bit announced all the things which went right. GA and right. went public or go preview. Um, I think like what I liked most to be honest was uh, the storage announcements like there were tons of Azure there storage were. announcements um, starting with Azure files for example like every like Azure files premium and like higher right. performance and as yeah. you mentioned before uh, Azure AD integration mm -hmm. Um, and then the other thing is like the big thing, which is pretty cool, is the Ultra yeah. SSD. Ultra one, SSD, yeah. Which like gives you a lot of performance. Um, and on the other hand, like they also ramp up the other uh, standard options, right? They got also better, better performance. Um, uh, they did not just announce something new; they also improved the other standard things. So that was like, I think, well, there was a lot more, right? But that was the thing I was uh, uh, like, which I was very happy about. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and that Ultra SSD, that's really interesting because I mean that, I think about the pure IOPS that that <laughs> service is going to provide and I'm I'm trying to think of a workload big enough. 160,000? Well, something like that. Yeah, I'm trying to think of a workload that's big yeah. enough to actually use that, you know? Ah, I mean, it's like it's like where we struggled a little bit in the past, right? If right. you like, if you have standard disk where you have five, very hot, sorry, very hot 500 IOPS or then even premium disk where the latency was good, but still, like if you compare it to real SAN performance, for yeah. example, then that's it, true. That's then true. it was difficult, right? And then now with that, with that 160,000 IOPS and I think two gigabytes right. of throughput or something like that, and insane. And I feel like, in order to address that, they needed to go here. But they <laughs> they yeah. went like way yeah. up here yeah. with the IOPS, you know. So, so, yeah, I mean that was really interesting to see. Yeah, that was uh, that was really cool. Well, so. they went there with the IOPS, but they also went there with the latency. I mean, like you were yeah. saying, they they went to sub one millisecond latency. They, they were yeah. what were they talking about? Microsecond latency. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah, yeah that's yeah. pretty crazy. I mean, that's pretty crazy. And, and then, actually, uh, in the we had a pre day. Well, mm -hmm. as you know, you guys were present at the pre day as well. But um, they told us that they they've been actually working on this for like two years now. And they're just, you know, yeah. talking about it now. And I'm thinking, boy, two years ago, there were still a lot of folks on spinning oh, disks. Yeah. Yep. You know, Definitely. They, you know, yeah. Flash was a big hype, you know, yeah. so. It must not have been an easy issue to fix, that's for yeah. sure. So, no. that's no. interesting. <laughs> well, yeah, that's that's a great a great uh, feature. And uh, I guess I'll pick on you next, Mike. Yeah, What was sure. your, uh, your gut reaction of the of the keynote? Well, I, I got I to gotta echo what Thomas said, because <laughs> when I saw, first of all, um, I didn't think that the, the, the Vision keynote had a lot of whiz bang wow you know it, yeah. it was very subdued it really was I mean I was looking 
people were, you know how they come out and they got the loud music and they <laughs> come out on stage and they say, hey, we got this and we got that, we yeah, got this, that's a good we point. That, yeah. you know? It was very, very subdued. That's I mean, um, Satya just basically laid it out there. Um, there wasn't a lot of bells and whistles and, and, and all that going on, but it was very effective, I thought. It was, it, it, like you said, they focused on uh, you, real stories, oh, right. use cases and real right. stories around all of this. Um, but I will agree with you, AI everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. Every, I mean, everywhere. Literally, in anything you do inside of a Microsoft application is being collected for AI. Yeah. I mean, we talk about everything, everything you do in office, everything Cortana hears and and and, and does for you and, and so on and so forth. It's all being collected into AI. Now, a little scary? Yeah, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> well, yeah, but I think that is also something you mentioned before, uh, like the Open Data Initiative. Yeah. They announced. Yeah. yeah. I think that was something addresses a little bit like those scenarios where people get your data, right? Yeah, and right. then who owns the data and things like right. that and it's your right it's your data and that is exactly what you're saying it's like ho I hope that was really interesting and probably you can say a little bit more about the announcement from yeah. people who haven't seen it i was really i, hang on one second. Yeah. I was yeah. really surprised that he referenced he cross-referenced it to our political stance here in the united yeah. states really exactly i was yeah. like i was like whoa where's he going <laughs> where, where are we going with that yeah because that, that could be a really <laughs> steep downhill slope really fast yeah, yeah. but um yeah, that was really interesting. So the Open, Open Data Initiative is an initiative between Microsoft, SAP, and Adobe, where basically they say that, okay, we are going to allow our ecosystems to talk to each other, you know, Azure, Adobe products, and SAP, and we're gonna make sure that the data plays well between all of those spaces, and that you, the customer, ultimately have control of said data. Now, um, you know, hopefully that does address the um, the privacy and security concerns. And I'm sure they're going to provide more details than they, they have in just a short blurb during the keynote. But definitely it's kind of an interesting place that they're going with that. So um, definitely that was an, another interesting thing. But you mentioned AI and AI being in everything. That kind of brings me to the keynote that Scott Guthrie did where they were talking about Azure Stack inside of an SUV, like a ruggedized Azure stack. I remember when they were doing that demo, they had, um, you know, I don't remember, I don't remember her name, but she was up on stage doing a HoloLens demo where some remote guy was, was helping her with this pump system and, you know, oh, yeah, with augmented that. reality, sure. they were saying, okay, you know, check this, this line of circuitry here. I mean, that was really neat, but I remember as they were stepping through that whole process from talking about the ruggedized Azure stack through the whole troubleshooting process and then what they did with that information after this troubleshooting process it was AI 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 big data yeah, like exactly it was just all AI and the stuff that they were doing with it so it was really interesting to see I mean they're taking AI from so many different yeah. entry points and combining it all together in this really and like they said it's almost like you're seeing the future almost you know yeah. Yeah, and that, not only that, but it comes down to it. I think one of the comments that was made during, uh, I think it was a side keynote, I think it was a data one, where they were talking about, you know, we're collecting all this data, like you said. Where is it all being stored? <laughs> uh, they started talking about how you have to store these massive amounts of, uh, of data. It's being stored yeah. in Ultra SSD. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice segue. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> um, yeah, that was... That was definitely interesting. Um, that's a good they question have, too. And they have that truck right here on the floor. They on do. The floor. That I walked is, by it earlier. I took a picture. Yeah, yeah I took yeah, it's really cool. I'll definitely have to post a picture of it in the uh, blog post that you're hopefully looking at right now <laughs> as you watch this video. So, but yeah, you know. What do you think about the Ultra SSD? Well, you know, we talked about that a, a few minutes ago, and do you think, but do you think it's actually gonna gonna uh, take a foothold in the market? Do you think people are gonna because it's got to come question. with a premium price? That's yeah, a good question. Absolutely, absolutely. I think the question comes down to whether, you know, what percentage of users need that level of IOPS? You know, I think it's gonna I think it's gonna start with your outliers. It's you're gonna it's gonna be your ten percent that are gonna use it at first, but oh maybe in five years. I mean, you think about the pace that we're we're going and the uh, the increasing hunger we have for performance and storage. I think maybe five years from now, 
maybe it'll be the norm. I don't know. Well, it, it solves one very, very important thing, and it's maybe not that you use like ultra SSD for every workload you have, right? right? It's like okay, you can still decide. You can for like optimize. Like I need very cheap storage for like workloads which do not need that performance but then you can like scale up until ultra ssd and i think one issue we had a lot is like well, oh, well a lot a lot of customers i saw had that issue was they had one particular workload which just didn't perform very well in azure like azure infrastructure uh, infrastructure service was just the storage platform could not bring enough high ups there right. or it was very sure. difficult to get it and um so this is now addressed so there's really like those last migrate workloads which you need to stay on prem for it um speaking about like huge sql servers or right. things like that where right. i think that addresses it so it adds another option for you where you can probably move, move the last five percent of the workloads as well where you had that issue that you were sure. not that performance sure. was just not there right Definitely. and you and you bring up the the migration as well I and mean, what we heard about it, uh, today is also the data box yeah, yeah that's so. a really <laughs> neat, neat concept. I mean, they've had the smaller data boxes for um, in public preview, two years, right? I think they have them like about two years now. Yeah, so if you're not aware, a, a data box is essentially a, or historically, it's been a small-ish box that you place on-premises somewhere. Self-contained with a shipping yeah. label right on it, and it just... You copy your, your local on-premises data to it, you ship it to an Azure data center somewhere, and... You know? uh, and it looked very cool. It did. It, 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 it looked did. very cool. It did. Now they've got that huge. What, what, I, I love. <laughs> yeah, I love no, the name too. Awesome. Azure Box or Azure, no Data Ad, Box Heavy. 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 Yeah. And it yeah. it really weighs 500 pounds. So it really is but, a heavy box. Yeah. But it's it's very interesting when you look at the design. Like you, we saw some pictures of it. Yeah. Right? Uh, it is really designed like when you have been to a data center. And you guys obviously also yeah. have been to data centers. It's really designed to bring it into the data center. Roll right? it in. It's not <laughs> just like okay, here's a big box and it's heavy. Okay. But if you look at it, it's like built to drive through a data center yeah. to, the, to like where very we have very small like. Like ways to go through and things like that, very small doors yep. and things. So I think it's pretty cool. They they actually wanted to for people to use it, yeah. not just the marketing thing. Hey, by the way, we also have something heavy. They actually <laughs> designed it in a functional manner. Yeah, they yeah. did. They did, and you, they actually have them on the floor, right? They have all yep. three sizes on the floor, and when you roll it in, all the connectors and everything uh, are basically on the outside of the box. Okay. So you don't have to open anything up. You just go in, you plug a cable in, you plug the power yeah. in, you're ready to go. Our we're and talking, we yeah, we're talking, you know, they talked about being able to bring these in on trucks, uh, $1,500 a ship, um, but bring it in on a truck, load up your data, take the, that one out, take another one, load up your data, and the, the, the real heart of it is, too, um, they just use RoboCopy. Um, they were talking about, just, they, all they do is they do a bunch of things that is still using RoboCopy, you know, but... It's a lot of data that they're pushing into these. Right. I, I, what is it? Uh, 80, 8 petabytes? Oh, I don't know. Yeah, I think the, around, the heavy was petabytes. Yeah, I think the heavy was one petabyte. One petabyte. One okay. Petabyte. Still, yeah. ton of data. Yeah. Um, and then they have um, Data Box Edge. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Which the virtual. Virtual. Yeah. yeah which is virtual. really interesting there too. And to my understanding, that sits on your network. Yeah. And almost so when you're writing to that device. You're writing locally, but then it's it's synced with it's, an Azure storage account. Sounds like box. It sounds like storage. <laughs> that's what it reminds me of. It's, it's, very, it, it's very like the concept feels like very much like exactly. store simple. Um, which is basically as you described it, like local. It feels like writing to local storage, but then it gets synced up to the cloud, and you right. can use that. I think they did some improvements for those guys who are already using store simple. Right. There, right. there is a little bit of. Um, like things they could have done better, so they did that. Right. Uh, and the other thing which you also mentioned is again AI, right? right. They, they, they allow you to basically run also, um, I think IoT Edge scenarios. Yeah, as well. that's, that's what they were mentioning. So that was that was really interesting. I mean, I know part of me would want those to be separate entities, but I mean, I guess if you're going to utilize it in a in an edge manner, maybe you want to do IoT Edge on it anyway, yeah. as opposed you know as opposed to just using it for the data box functionality. So that's it'll be interesting to see how the how that use case becomes less murky over time. Oh, or think about scenarios. I think they're not only addressing like the typical file storage. Think about a scenario where um, you basically want to analyze it. So like basically um, send the data in, like move big the chunks of data into the cloud get it analyzed in the cloud and send it back and then you have like 
IoT Edge, which can sure. react already on that, That's get that true. information yeah. back. So you only have to have this device and he can go back and forth with information and then run locally uh, where you need more response time. And my understanding on that too is that it's more of a rental. It, you, you don't actually buy the hardware, you basically mm -hmm. rent that hardware, that IoT Edge. So you bring it into your data center and you're only paying for it as long as you use it. Right, okay. So it's not something you actually, you have to have that upfront investment. Right. You know, Microsoft saying, well, you use it, and if you don't need it anymore, we, you send it back and you're done. That's true, that's true. So. It makes it a little bit less risky to try it up that way too, because you're not making this big capital expenditure, right? right so, right. interesting. I think I need one now. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Well, uh, you know, there were a couple other key things here that I want to touch base on before we wrap it up. I mean, um, you know, they announced a whole bunch of new uh, Azure virtual machine sizes, um, some interesting uh, use cases within NVIDIA, yep. you know, yep. hardware baked in. Uh, the Not other thing... compute with Intel. Yeah, yeah, yep, that's another big one. The other one that stood out to me was the Windows Virtual Desktop. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I, you know, before I you know, became an evangelist for Altero, I spent 10 years in the managed services space. and. One thing that we often struggled with was either RDS or um, things like VMware Horizon View, as it's called or now. Or Citrix. And yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's and it's interesting to see Microsoft starting to get into that game, utilizing Azure as a platform for virtual desktop, you know? Finally. finally. Uh, to be honest, to exactly. be honest, finally. I mean, it was such an obvious thing to I do know, for right? years, right? Yeah. And we, everyone was waiting for it. If you look at RDS servers, it's a perfect workflow for the cloud. You turn them yep. on during the day, during work hours, and then you like shut them down. And then next day you start them again, right? And yep. there was just no way of, like, proper way of doing it. Well, there were some competitors or like partners, let's put it that Pardon, way, right? doing it on right. top of it. But now this announcement I think is huge. And I think this is going to be very interesting. Definitely. Um, I, to, to be honest, I still need to like have a better look at it. I also don't know yet. Yeah, but I, it, it looks promising. I could see it being a big win for service providers. You know, um, you know, maybe they've got customers that they don't want to have a full-blown desktop, or maybe they, you know, their workforce is disparate and distributed across the yep. world, and maybe they want to open their iPad and connect to a desktop that way. It, it's really useful and kind of. You know, those types of situations I could see. So I, I have a, uh, you know, being involved in the, my previous life, I worked as a, uh, for a desktop as a service provider, right? Um, and when we put it out there, we were using Zen Desktop. Right, right. And I don't know, you gentlemen probably know, but I'm a Citrix CTP as well, which is kind of like the MVP program right. for right. Microsoft. Um, I can tell you that the Zen App Essentials and Zen Desktop Essentials, which Citrix has been putting into uh, Azure, and Microsoft has been pushing behind there, like, you know, this is really a cool thing. This was somewhat of a surprise for a lot of folks on the Citrix side. Uh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. Um, and the thing about it is, is that one thing that Microsoft has always done well, I don't, you go all the way back to the NT days, um, and personally, I think they've always done terminal services really well. Yeah. They, you know, the terminal services has been, a, it's, it's a rock, it's a foundation. They, you know, they go to RDS, you know, they, they and, and so on and so forth. It's always been a very firm foundation. Right. And now they're actually getting it right and putting it into the cloud under the RDS's umbrella. Right. Okay. Uh, but they're, at the same time, Maybe, you know, causing a little rip with the, yeah. the Citrix folks. Yeah, it's going to be interesting um, how that plays yeah, out over time yeah, here. Yeah, um, because, you know, there was minimum seats involved on the Citrix side. There was, uh, you know, licensing. Microsoft would charge their licensing, and Citrix would also charge for their cloud services. Now, Microsoft mm. is kind of like doing yep. one build kind of Fiscally, a thing. Fiscally, it's going to be more attractive. I mean, if I have to go over here and get two or three products, and over here yeah, I do the same thing yeah, for yeah. one, yeah, so I'm gonna look really hard at that simple option. You and, know? and if this is turns out to be more of a subscription base, where you're just paying for the license based on your usage, you use a, a desktop for a week, you're only paying a subscription price for a week. You're not paying for the full license. That's very true. I mean, realistically, that could be, you yeah. know, something that is a game changer. You know, that more people will actually because remember when a VDI was a thing, right? Right. So, uh, everybody thought that, yeah, everybody thought that like five years ago, VDI was the year of VDI. It's going to be know, a, right? uh, it never how many happened. years has that been now? <laughs> it never happened. Every year for like the last five years, right? 
But, but I probably I found like last year was the Linux desktop yeah. or something. <laughs> yeah. But I, realistically, <laughs> it, it, this could be the game changer. This could be the pivot point for that. Yeah. Right. Definitely. What, what I also found very sorry to add something okay. here, but what, what I also found very interesting is that it said optimized for Office 365. Oh, as well. it did. Yeah. That's and right. I think that's right. Quite interesting because I remember that uh, the Office 365 and terminal servers were not that nicely no, in the past. Yeah, they did not yeah. play that nice, right? Yeah. And I, I think that's, that's also very interesting. Right, the licensing part of that, I remember, was difficult. Oh, also be, yeah. Now, my, yeah. my information on that's a little dated, but I remember three, four, five yeah. years ago in terminal server situations where you had multiple users coming on to you know, the yep. same RDS server, licensing 365 was a little bit yeah. difficult, yeah. Yeah. you know? Yes, it was, and you got the same thing with profiles. Right. So you had profile management, which is always mandatory, or roaming, or, <laughs> right. or what have you, if the, you know, so on and so forth. So now there's actually some profile vendors out there um, that can solve that problem yeah. uh, as a third-party solution. But Microsoft, you know, they had the uh, they had a product that they tried to do profiles with. It was part of the MDOT package, or the yeah. uh, I don't remember what it was called. Um, but they tried to tried to fix that, and it really didn't work so well. Yeah. Um, but I'm hoping that this, you know, this, like I said, levels the playing field and gets everybody back on track because, like you said, a lot of task workers and remote workers don't want the full desktop. They don't want to carry this thing right. around. They exactly. don't want that. They just want to be able to connect to a desktop in the cloud, and then when they're done with it, go away. Right. Exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, it's definitely going to be interesting to see how it plays out and uh, that and everything else that's been announced at uh, Ignite so far this week. So, well, again, you know. Mandy Sirwich. I've been joined by Mike Nelson and Thomas Maurer. So thanks again, guys, for Thank joining you. me today and, and talking. It's always great to get together and just kind of, you know, talk tech. It's always fun. So, And uh, be sure, again, to uh, check out all of the other Ignite-focused videos we've got out there. I'm going to be updating uh, this blog post that, again, I hope you're reading right now. Uh, I'm going to be updating this blog post throughout the week with additional content, additional video content, and uh, I don't know, who knows, maybe I'll have one of these guys in front of the camera again at some point. So. <laughs> Anyway, thanks again, guys. Thank you. Thank and you. Uh, thanks for watching. Thanks. Have a good one. Bye.